Uh, most uh, Westminster watchers or people that I talk to actually say this hasn't gone away, that if at the end of this process, the Prime Minister is uh, found to have uh, committed a crime, albeit a, a, a misdemeanor, if you like, and is fined, that would be extraordinarily serious and quite difficult for him to extricate himself from, although he's indicated uh, that he is going to fight it. And to have uh, a Prime Minister and a, a government group of people in, in number 10 that have imposed the strictest uh, denial of liberty on ordinary people of this country in peacetime um, in history um, and then not live by those same rules, why they were making such huge sacrifices, um, I find in incredibly difficult. Really do. Ruth Davidson, morning, Ruth. Morning to you. How are you today? Very good, thank you. And political journalist, esteemed political journalist, Adam Bolton. Good morning, Adam. Good morning to you. Welcome to the show. You can join the conversation by texting 87222, start your message with the word Times, tweet at Times Radio, or emailing studio at times.radio. Uh, let's talk about the sanctions that are being imposed. Uh, the United States is going to block the Russian government from using Western financial markets to raise money. Western leaders generally have also signed off on plans to target specific Russian oligarchs and their business interests. Um, Adam, if I could start with you. I'm struck by that, that, the line that uh, Liz Truss said to Asma earlier. It's likely that he will carry on and invade in any circumstance. And we, we hear often politicians talking about the deterrent effect of sanctions, but they also seem to concede in the same breath that there is no deterrent effect in sanctions. He's going to do this whatever sanctions we might do. What do you think the collective purpose of sanctions has become? Well, I think there's a collective purpose we're seeing from Washington and London of uh, a new approach to intelligence, of uh, making very clear what they know, what they think is going to happen. Uh, and therefore, it would seem to me that the only logic of uh, London's position, which, frankly, whatever Liz Truss says, the UK appears to have put in rather weaker sanctions uh, than anybody else, certainly than the United States, is to hold back uh, in the expectation, A, uh, that you're going to have to bring in much tougher, broader sanctions, and B, uh, that uh, it's just possible uh, that that threat could uh, stay the hand uh, of the Russian forces. Although I have to say, uh, what is very apparent at Westminster, you know, talking to Tory MPs and all the others, is incredible sensitivity uh, amongst uh, Conservatives uh, about their uh, links to Russians or former Russians or Russian donors and a strong desire not to talk about that at all. And currently, a strong desire not to threaten uh, those possible sources of cash. Is, do you think that's a real thing that's actually... Is, would you go so far as to say that's impacting on government policy? Yeah, I think it's clearly impacting on government policy because we know that we've had Intelligence Committee reports into the involvement uh, of uh, Russia uh, in uh, British society, which this government is declining to publish, uh, which gives a strong impression that there is something to hide and a strong impression that there is something uh, that they want to protect. Um, Ruth, what do you make about the idea that the, the, the government's staying its hand for, in some way? Yeah, I mean, I think the Foreign Secretary has laid out and the Prime Minister laid out in the House yesterday that this is a ratcheting effect, that um, if Russia does invade, more sanctions will follow, and if it continues to oh. act, then there will be counteractions against it. And actually, all of the countries have said that. So the EU said that, uh, the US has said that. Um, I think also in terms of the moving the money around, uh, so being able to raise debt on the um, mar markets, that's that's one of the big ones. We need legislation for that. That's being brought in. Um, but that's the one that's going to hurt them. Um, and we will see more going forward. But yeah, I mean, I think like lots of people, um, when the Prime Minister read that out, there was a little bit of, is that it yesterday? Uh, from me and, and, and hundreds of others. Um, but I do understand the policy that there has to be something left in the tank. You've got to have a reserve to, to, to bring in and bring in. You know, we'll see how much happens in the next few days. I guess the point is, do we believe psychologically? I mean, Putin, you know, lots of people say to us, um, Putin will have already played this out in his mind to a certain extent. There'll be sanctions. How much he cares about the, the Russian public is an interesting question. You know, he controls the political establishment. He controls the media establishment. He's not going to be subject to any revolution anytime soon. Uh, we heard from Roger Boyser. He wants his mark in history. He wants to do something that Vladimir Putin will be remembered for in 200, 300 years' time. And that might mean colonial expansion. That might mean going into countries and taking them irrespective of what the West is going to do. Because if they're not in NATO, they're not going to fire a gun in, in response to them either. Well, I think in terms of the psychology of the man, um, we, we spoke to um, 
uh, Lord Robertson, the former Secretary General of NATO, who met him, you know, a half a dozen times more than that, actually, at the beginning, and, and has looked at his journey and how he's changed and what he used to say when he was starting out as Prime Minister and President uh, and what he says now and, and the progression of, of how that strongman persona and how that having that place in history, how that hubris that comes when you are unchallenged in such a way for so long changes it. And um, I agree with your assessment, actually, that I don't think... Uh, I, I think the overriding issue for him is to have that mark in history. However, it's very hard to do that if all of the people around you are wailing because... Um, their income streams have been cut off, their assets have been frozen, their children have been kicked out of the countries that they're living in. You know, there are other considerations that go on around a leader as well. So I, I think that the um, I think the international community has got things that they can do which will hurt the people around Vladimir Putin uh, and that will destabilise the leadership, the wider leadership of Russia. Um, but they have to get on and do it. But, but you're right. I mean, I, I don't think there has been any move from the rest of the world to say that they will you know, step in militarily to stop anything because Ukraine is not part of a wider military alliance. Do you think it should promise not to be part of a military alliance, Adam? Do you think that's possible? We talked to a, a German former advisor to NATO saying that ultimately this is a bit of the whole uh, NATO expansionist argument, which I'm not sure is entirely credible, but it's there in Germany, certainly. And this, this guy said to us, uh, we should just declare collectively that Ukraine will be protected and it won't join NATO. And those two things will have to be connected. Can you see any form of concession like that being given? Because that would be a huge win for Putin, you would imagine. Well, that's certainly something Putin asked for explicitly in the uh, documents he published just before Christmas. He would like the West to basically say, it's been a mistake. Uh, we've had too much Western expansion into uh, the former Soviet Union, and we're going to roll back and we guarantee that we're not going to do with that. Two problems with that. One is that uh, as we made clear, those countries that have now joined NATO, such as the Baltic states, uh, which are in the European Union, it's not possible really for us to resile on that, uh, even if we wanted to, which I don't think we do. The other problem is effectively since 2008, uh, I was at the NATO summit in Romania and pretty much there, NATO did say, well, we're not saying in principle Ukraine or Georgia could never become members of NATO, but we are saying in practice it's not going to happen. So really, Putin got what he wanted way back then. And what is worrying him is really the developments towards democracy which have taken place in, in the Ukraine. And, and I think this question about sanctions, it, it's interesting here, Ruth, talking about targeting the people around Putin. For sanctions to work, they've got to be not targeted. They've got to really hit the Russian economy and there'll be pain on our side as well in order for the Russians to feel that their leader is endangering their day-to-day -day life. And that is uh, where Putin uh, will start to feel threatened uh, as, as the leader from uh, domestic unrest, which is clearly what he's worried about in his whole approach uh, to wanting to stamp on Ukraine. Just quickly, Ruth, what do you think? Well, I, I think on the Ukraine, let's just you know give up the idea that they could sometimes uh, they they could join NATO even if we say we protect them. Let's not forget we said we would protect them. We said if they gave up the nuclear capabilities that they had and they made sure that they were made safe, we would protect them even if they weren't in NATO. So we have responsibilities there that I fear that we have not lived up to in Crimea that we're not living up to now. That's an interesting point. Uh, stay there, both of you. Uh, we'll come back to discuss more of the issues of the day. That's Ruth Davidson and Adam Bolton. It's nine twenty-one. This is Times Radio. Break. Story that in other times would have been the top story. It would have been the front page splash on uh, many papers. But of course, uh, Ukraine has displaced it. A leaked form has confirmed that Boris Johnson has become the first British Prime Minister to be questioned under caution by police. The questionnaire was distributed by the Met Police to the 88 people accused of attending Downing Street parties during uh, lockdown. Um, Adam, Ukraine is obviously incredibly important, uh, but... Boris Johnson becoming the first prime minister to be questioned under caution is also important. Is there a concern that this story is going to disappear slightly? I think certainly as far as the news agenda is concerned, uh, the pressure appears to be off Boris Johnson for now. But I have to say, uh, most uh, Westminster watchers or people that I talk to actually say this hasn't gone away, that if at the end of this process the Prime Minister is uh, found to have uh, committed a crime, albeit a, a, a misdemeanour, if you like, and is fined, that would be extraordinarily serious and quite difficult for him to extricate himself from, although he's indicated uh, that he is going to fight it. And this will come back on the agenda once we get 
the results uh, of this inquiry. Uh, and uh, I think Mr Johnson will be held to account. I mean, we're, we're hearing rumours, certainly, that there are more Conservative MPs and quite possibly some members of the Cabinet who would be prepared to stand up and say uh, mm. that a Prime Minister who is uh, found guilty, if you like, and given a fixed penalty notice, uh, should have to resign. Remember, Tony Blair said at the time he would resign even if he was questioned under caution uh, over the uh, cash for honours business. And of course, that's now happened. It is a historic first. We've got a prime minister uh, being questioned under caution, albeit remotely, apparently, by this questionnaire. Mm. Um, Ruth Davison, you were um, noticeably and uh we we saw that you getting very upset about the allegations around people uh, having parties while other people couldn't do the basics, uh, couldn't see their loved ones, couldn't say goodbye to them, all the rest of it. Are you concerned that this story might lose a bit of steam? Well, my my concern is much greater about how much of a story in the media it is or not. I you know one of the reasons I'm a conservative is because I believe in the institutions of this country mm. and to have uh, a prime minister and a a government group of people in, in number 10 that have imposed the strictest uh, denial of liberty on ordinary people of this country in peacetime um, in history um, and then not live by those same rules, why they were making such huge sacrifices, um, I find in incredibly difficult, really difficult. And the issue that I have is also you know, in terms of the office of prime minister, we've got such a, a crisis of faith in the institutions, not just in this country, but in lots of countries around the world. And um, we don't just, we shouldn't just expect, we should demand that our leaders set an example. And if mm. you're not leading by example, then, you, you know, you're you're not leading. And uh, for for me, you know, actually, we've already crossed the Rubicon and it's not just being interviewed under caution. It's a prime minister standing up in the House of Commons saying, well, I was outraged when I learned that all of these events and parties and all the rest of it were happening. And then we find out that he was at at least four of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, I, I can't find a way to reconcile that not being lying to the House. And that is an absolute resignation matter. And it, are just, you, it just is. Yeah. And <laughs> are you heartened by these rumours that we hear about uh, people within the Cabinet perhaps uh, resigning? Well, I just, I just... Depending on the outcome. I just look at some of my MP colleagues and I just wonder what it is that they are waiting for. For? You know, are they waiting for Sue Gray Part 2 to do their job for them? Are they waiting for the Metropolitan Police to do their job for them? Or are they seeing something that I'm not seeing? Because I'm I'm seeing a Prime Minister who has, you know, broken the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of a single Prime Minister in my lifetime that wouldn't already have walked. I think they'll, they'll say they're waiting for the outcome of, of the police investigation, however long that's going to take. 88 questionnaires... Who knows? Um, Adam, just, just to cut a, a point on this, a cynic would say that Ukraine is a convenient distraction for um, for Boris Johnson from Partygate. Yeah, well, it may be. And, and clearly Boris Johnson has long had these ambitions to uh, sort of strike a Churchillian pose. I think the, the problem with that is, first of all, mercifully, we don't expect that British troops will actually be going to war and putting their lives at risk. So this isn't going to be a war in that sense. And secondly, as is very clear, uh, the UK does not have a leading role uh, in this. It's supporting the Allies, as Liz Truss said, working with Allies, but it's by no means uh, the most uh, uh, dominant country involved. America, Russia, France uh, are all really ahead on that. So I don't think there is the opportunity really to stand up as the great leader and demand national unity uh, at a time of threat to the nation. So I, 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 I get the sense uh, and again, this is from talking to politicians yesterday, that they don't feel uh, that if Mr Johnson tries to strike that pose, uh, he's really going to convince anybody. And in fact, not only domestically, uh, but internationally, uh, there's been quite a lot of mockery of both uh, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss's performance so far. Interesting stuff. Uh, let's finish on the happiness officer. An employer at Clifford Chance Law Firm is standing for the role of chief happiness officer in an attempt to increase positivity in the workplace. Jonathan Cooley, the lawyer behind the scheme, says he hopes to bring joy to the harassed solicitors pulling all night shifts. Uh, I don't believe any of this, uh, Ruth. I think, if you work for, I think if you work for a magic circle law firm and you say, can I not do my work today? I want to be happy. 
I don't want to work. To, I just don't. Uh, well, I don't buy this. I think when there's money to be earned, people's heads will be to the grindstone. Yeah, well, I read the piece um, <coughs> and have have no, uh, you know, uh, relationship with any law firm ever, and not clearly not a lawyer. So I, I don't know how these things work. But one guy seems to be standing on a platform as we can all have a four day week, uh, and you know we'll have jesters and in, in, in your lunch break or something. <laughs> and another guy seems to be standing on a platform of I'm going to give you a really brilliant pension, and I'm uh, even though you're still going to have to work like dogs, which is what you joined this firm for. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty sure. I know who's going to win, and it's going to be the gold-plated <laughs> pension guy, isn't it? It must be, must be. I, I think uh, maybe Cooley's just maybe he's a sort of screaming Lord Such candidate in all, in all of this. Uh, Adam, you strike me as a curmudgeonly character who would not necessarily want to work for a place with a chief happiness officer. Have <laughs> I no, read your character a bit right? Like you. A bit well, like you. I, I certainly think uh, enforced corporate jollity is something that I've always tried to avoid. That said, I actually think there is some substance in this. This is a generational thing, right? There's an election to be a managing partner amongst the lawyers. And we've seen not just at Clifford Chance in law firms, we've seen at um, bankers like Goldman Sachs and indeed in hospitals with junior doctors, a rising generation of people. And as I work it out, this guy who's proposing happiness is around about 40, standing up against people who are in their late 50s or maybe 60s uh, as a candidate. And there is an expectation, a different approach to work and hard work and being bullied at work, uh, which is probably a healthy thing coming from younger people. So I do think things are changing. Yeah, we've had a text. I mean, I can't, I, we cannot confirm, substantiate yes. the identity of this test, but someone's suggesting that this man will not indeed win. Uh, very much on, <laughs> on, they say they're a member of the, the law firm themselves and they, they, they're, they're team Ruth in terms of, of where this election's going. I do think, I do take the generational point there. And also, yeah. there are some things more important than, than gold plated pensions. No, absolutely. And I think that um, I agree with Adam that people's expectation of the workplace and how they divide their work life from their home life when the lines are blurred and you get emails from your boss at midnight and all that sort of stuff. And what you, what you demand and what the rules are that you put on yourself and the time that you give to your families is such but I still think there is a certain sort of person that is attracted to working for a Clifford Chance or an Eversheds or any of these other kind of really really big firms where you know you have to put in the hours and it's not just the results but it's the presenteeism that counts mm. in terms of getting up the ladder and there is a certain psyche and a, a kind of hunter killer instinct that, that happens with that. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's probably I think that's probably entirely right. We'll but, see. We'll, we'll get him on if he wins, Jonathan Cooley. You, <laughs> you, you have a place here if you win your if you win your 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 election. Uh, we'll get you on. Uh, great to speak to you both, uh, Adam. Thank you so much for joining our program for the first time. Our pleasure. And uh, that's Adam Bolton there and Ruth Davidson. Uh, you, uh, you enjoyed your first show. You looking forward to your second one? I am. Yes. So I'm just off to uh, pre-record a, a, an Olympic gold medalist, a, a winter Olympic gold medalist. So um, there aren't so many yeah. of them, so we can probably yeah, probably, ex can probably exactly. Work out who that is. It wasn't from this Olympics, but it's looking back. So we we do a, a, a great thing called Been There, Done That, and it's something that's been in the news, but it's somebody that's done it before and can tell you, like, lift the curtain, look behind the scenes, all of that good stuff. So yeah. Great stuff. Well, that's Ruth Davidson who will be presenting on Friday at one o'clock here on Times Radio. It is 9.32. Let's get the news now with Rachel Jewell.